I think the actual act of creating um, can be more important than what you create. And I feel like if you create enough, you actually get to be incredibly good at whatever the area you're creating in. I mean, none of us start as typically none of us start as amazing at what they what they do it's something you build up to it's it's your 10th project or your 20th project that's the one that that you know shows oh wait a minute this this person has some real talent this is way of the artist with brandon colby cook and evan schulte identifying your blocks and demystifying your struggles so that you can claim your own path and make your life a work of art Hey, podcast people, we have a guest for you today. And this is actually one of my favorite people in the world. His name is Gabriel Napora. He is a filmmaker at heart. And you would have known that if you would have seen anything we talked about before we started this, because we're all on video here and he made sure the frame was perfect. I did. <laughs> filmmaker, yeah, I have to. Yeah. <laughs> He's also a producer. Um, he just, uh, I think he just wrapped on a film that you just did. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a there's a huge resume for this guy um, as far as the film industry goes and just getting stuff made. And he's an awesome guy who's going to bring in a lot of insights, I think, today. And we're going to get into his story about how he got to where he is and some of the challenges he faced along the way. Um, he's been a mentor to me. He's been one of my best friends. And I'm glad to have you, Gabe. Well, it's, it's an honor to be here. And, you know, I, I think the same of you, Brandon. Uh, I've only uh, thought very highly of our friendship, you know, since the very beginning. And, and just like you called me, uh, you know, one of your mentors, I think of you motivationally as one of mine. And Evan, the, the little bit of experience we've had together, I've enjoyed definitely as well. Um, I think you're a great person, too. So thank you both for having me on. Awesome. Well, thank so, you so much for including me in the triangle. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, well, let's let's just let's hop into it. Uh, you know, I, I have a question for you, and I've been thinking about this uh, all week. Was I never asked you how did how did you even get into filmmaking? Like, how did how did this even happen for you? So my story is uh, is interesting in that, you know, you hear so many people say that that they expected to be a filmmaker from a young age and it was their dream and, uh, you know, things just turned out for them. It was never my dream. I always loved films. I always thought films were amazing. I watched a lot of films as a kid with my parents uh, and, and it was a passion to watch those. Um, but I always thought I'd be an entrepreneur. You know, my uncle always said, um, if you want to make the money you want to make, you have to own your own company and not work for anyone else. So I, you know, thought maybe I'd own a, a manufacturing company or some sort of sales company or something like that. So I was born in, in Edmonton, Alberta. And um, when it came time to finish high school, I was kind of deciding what I would get into. And I decided to get into business management, which I felt, you know, in college, which I felt would get me to the position of where I could own my own company. So I did two years of business management. Uh, at the end of that, you get a diploma. And uh, that summer at, at the end, when I graduated, I decided to go into sales and I went into selling high-end security alarms, security alarms that cost about $5,000 to sell. So I'm this, you know, young looking kind of kid at 20 years old, thin and um, kind of awkward going out and trying to sell these $5,000 security alarms virtually door to door. The, the short version of it is over the course of an entire summer and probably after oh, it must have been like 30 sales calls, 30 to 40 sales calls, I didn't sell a single alarm. So the way I kind of thought my life went, would go, you know, which is being successful in sales and, and starting my own company uh, as a launch pad from that isn't how it went. So unsure of what to do, broke and, uh, you know, sort of clueless, I decided to go back to my school, uh, which was Nate Northern Alberta Institute of Technology, and see what other programs they offered. And on a whim, they had a, a bulletin board that, that said that the film program there, the TV and radio program, was looking for actors for a production. Nothing to lose, no money, you know, or whatever, but why not? Give it a try. Uh, I auditioned, I got the role. And, you know, when I was in the process of acting, I didn't, I didn't actually enjoy the acting, but I thought the behind the scenes was, was very, very cool. So um, 
I decided to then enroll in the film and, and TV program there, the TV and radio program, and specialize in TV. Uh, worked my butt off. At the end, you had to do a four-month unpaid practicum, which means you're working for a company for four months unpaid. And I did mine at a, at a TV commercial company. Uh, and in the beginning, I was a production assistant, but there was one guy named Jerry Heideck, um, who took a who took a liking to me and decided to kind of bring me under his wing and taught me to write, produce, and direct all three of those things. And the short version is like, I was kind of a screw up, but he still saw something in me. And uh, at the end of that four month practicum, I was 23 years old and he made me a producer. So at that point I was actually producing national, international and regional commercials, uh, directing, writing. It, it was the greatest education you could ever have. And it was literally because of one man. Like I owe my career to that one guy who, despite me not necessarily in the beginning being very good, saw something in me and, and allowed me to, you know, follow what, what did become my dream, which was producing. I did that for a while, started my own company and, you know, a, a lot of peaks and valleys and the rest is kind of history. <laughs> I absolutely love that. Like, just as as you're telling that story, I'm like, your story is, as a storyteller, I'm like, is a classic sort of story. You know, it's like the the screw up who has a mentor who sees something in them to become something. You know, like I'm like, kid. oh yeah. yeah it's, 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 I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, put myself as skilled as a karate kid in the end. But you know, I would say. Uh, having a mentor and having somebody who believes in you and, and, and says, no, you can do this. You're screwing up, but you can do this. <laughs> it just it just made all the difference in the world. And uh, I, there's nothing I could do in my lifetime to honor what Jerry did for me other than doing great work. You know, like that's that's because uh, there's not, no way to give back for how selfless he was with me. That's awesome. There, there's um, a, a speaker, his name's uh, uh, Brian Tracy. Um, yeah. and, and he talks about, uh, he talks about having a mentor. And um, he talks about how like much that mentor like um, changed his life. And um, his mentor was actually a big reason why he became as su successful as he did, because he felt the same way. Like, I just, if I never met this person, and he was this similar to you, right? Um, he was, he was kind of broke and struggling and whatever. And this person took an interest in him and he decided to take that person's advice and, and listen to him. And he actually even lost everything at one point and got it back. But, um, because of that mentorship, you know, it really made him into who he was. It's, it, it, yeah. it, it's everything. And, you know, if I wasn't in the field I was in, I honestly can't say now what I would be, you know, would, would I be, pushing broom somewhere, you know, for minimum wage, would I be uh, in some other spot? It's just, it's one of those things where it, I don't necessarily believe in destiny, but it feels like it was destiny to, to follow this path. And then, you know, you find your dream. I'm, I'm, I'm again, not somebody who had this as a dream, but then it really became my dream. And, and now, you know, getting to produce cool stuff and some of the projects we've been, I, I have to pinch myself. Like I'm, I'm constantly, amazed that life turned out this way and, and how fortunate I am to get to be creative in a, in a great field. Yeah. Well, I mean, sometimes you just, you know, you kind of, from your story, it sounds like you just, you just sort of follow a curiosity. You follow, you know, just, just some little blip of something that sparks something. And even though, you know, like we talk about this on the show, sometimes the, the thing that you start out with, you know, like it, it's, it, it is just a, maybe a passing fascination, but that thing opens the door, it opens the window to something else that's just, that, that just is everything for you. Very much so. And I think, you know, regardless, I, I think the other thing that's sort of interesting, and obviously I was young when this happened, but I can say this throughout my career, is you're never just given one chance. Like you fail at something it's not the end. It's, it's, a, it's an ultimate lesson in everything. And if you don't give up, there's only one inevitability and that's some level of success. Hmm. It's, it's almost impossible to fail if you don't give up. And, and the ride is, you know, at times it's windy, at times it's painful, but, but in the end, it's a great ride and you learn so much. Hmm. There's, um, there's actually a, a quote that I, when I hear it or read it, I always think of you, Gabe. Mm -hmm. It's um by this guy uh, 
I always say his name wrong, but it's Navel Rivikent, I think it is. I think it's how you say it. I might be saying it wrong. But his quote was this, be impatient with action, but patient with results. So it's very profound. I can, I can definitely, you know, I can definitely see that. And uh, the people I know who have been really successful, and even if I, I look at my own success to whatever degree, uh, it's always come from action. And you, you inevitably make so many mistakes and you learn so many, you know, ideally you learn so many lessons from those mistakes, but um, action is what allows you to gain any level of success. Yeah, like even with the acting, like I never even heard that story from you before and I'm glad I asked, but like you you follow a curiosity to go out and like, that's so great. You were like, I, I might as well like try acting. And then you realize like you went for acting, realize acting wasn't even the thing, but that led you to see something that you never would have sought, you know? And that's that's such an interesting thing. And then that path to that mentor was really you just kind of following whatever like this curiosity inside of you and I, I like Evan and I talk about this so much it's so great to have someone like yourself on just to like come on and like tell their story and it's like literally like it's it's amazing because it's like that's exactly what we're always kind of trying to point out is like you got to follow that curiosity but you also took action you you tried it you know and I think that's such an important part of the the story not to miss well, it's really, it's really everything, you know, I mean, the, the, the interesting thing for me about life is I know some incredibly smart people, far smarter than I am, you know, genius level. But there's sometimes like a paralysis to being too smart where uh, you convince yourself not to do things. And, and sometimes, you know, people who are, let's say, less intelligent, but just go for it. Um, experience far greater success because there isn't that, you know, analysis kind of paralysis. And, you know, I think whatever the situation is in the world, regardless of, you know, where you are and, and how you are w with certain limitations, I mean, people can be under very awful regimes at times, right? And, and, and be in horrible situations. But in most cases, by taking action in, in whatever scenario you're in, you're going to be far better off than by sitting out and waiting or by overanalyzing anything. And, and we're kind of like scientists. I feel like, uh, you know, a scientist experiments and experiments and experiments until they have like some level of success with their experiments or get their hypothesis sort of worked out. And I, I think it's the same for us. We're just scientists going through life, trying to figure things out and experimenting. I, I, I want to ask you, did you always know how to fail or was that something that you had to learn? Oh, man, I, I, I think when I started out, I was so naive. I didn't think I was going to fail. Like, if anything, I was probably when, when I entered that sales job, you know, for the security alarms, I thought I was going to sell a bunch of alarms and it was going to be the launching pad to a lot of things. And then you know, when I got into TV and film, I thought it was going to be far easier than, than it was. I didn't, I didn't take to it naturally. I'm not naturally a technical person necessarily. And they taught you a lot of, a lot of technical things. So I, I think I experienced, you know, at a relatively young age failure, um, a lot more than, you know, the average person. And even, you know, the practicum that I did, I didn't take to producing right away. It's nothing I ever considered doing. It wasn't, again, it wasn't anything I would have considered in a million years. And, and I failed so much both as a production assistant and initially as a producer. My, my initial work was complete trash. Um, but I think what you learn from that is, is you learn that it's never the end. It's, it's, it's something that you bounce back from no matter how hard you fall. You know, and unless you do something terribly life-changing, like, you know, so hor horrible, like kill someone or something awful like that, I mean, there's really no scenario you can't bounce back from as a person. There's, there's no scenario where you're not given a second chance. And, and I even discovered that for myself, you know, being very close to some, some very big things early on and not having them happen and then having some great things happen kind of later in my career you're never given one chance. So failure isn't failure isn't failure. It's a lesson. Hmm. And, and like, um, you know, maybe we can get into that a little bit. Cause I remember when I met you, um, you know, there, like you had, you had gone through or were going through, you went through like a really, like someone really screwed you over mm -hmm. and that like, 
it, it was like you've told me a bit about the story I, I, if you're open to getting into it but it's like such a like like in in screenwriting it's that moment i i always teach people it's that rock bottom moment and it's where it's like the character is totally lost and they feel like they're going to almost walk away and give up on everything they've worked for and and i fortunately and unfortunately you know in its own little way got to experience that with you to some degree and, and yes. kind of um which is an amazing thing i mean to to have somebody um you know i felt like i was trying to do my best to support you but at the same time i was getting the benefit of experiencing it with you but you kind of went through this um uh, and at least in my interpretation kind of this your career was one way then you hit this devastating moment just devastating like the thing that scares every filmmaker producer like anybody who gets into this and you 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 recovered from that and bounced back um do you mind like telling us a bit about like that experience yeah. and what happened and yeah, I mean, absolutely. So, I mean, I, I incorporated my company in, in 1999, a long time, and, and worked my way up through music videos and commercials, um, discovered some pretty amazing talent that, you know, it, it at least made people take me seriously. Um, in 2011, I kind of had some really good momentum going with Hollywood. I had, I had started to transition out of... Uh, music videos and commercials and wanted to get into films like it just felt like that's the graduating step up um, and you know this the short version of it is uh, I was introduced to a horrible human being in in LA who seemed to be uh, a, a great guy you know manager of a, of a big actor and uh, a very significant guy and and the short version of it is him and a lawyer um, defrauded myself and a series of investors out of, you know, a relatively huge chunk of money on a, on a film deal. Um, and then what, what happened after that essentially was you have to sue to try and get everything back. Like you find out you're defrauded. And, and the day that I found out, in fact, it was fraud was one of the worst days of my life because it hits you hard. Like you have a certain... Uh, idea of how the world works that the world is you know if you're if you're a good person you have a, a hypothesis that the world is full of good people and you're not going to run into bad people and that day that i found out that i you know that there was actually fraud in this it, it's like my whole world changed everything i thought that was real wasn't and you know that there are horrible people in the world so i spent the next you know bunch of years um, chasing the money in court and the issue with fraudsters is they know how to delay things and they know how to um, you know play in court and they know uh, when, when somebody's playing chess with you and they can they can they can break the rules and you can't break the rules you're playing by the rules you're inevitably going to have a match where it's very difficult to win so chase the money for you know a series of years and um, it took me down, like as a filmmaker, I would say for three years when I had great momentum, put me into, um, you know, I would, I would say a, a strong depression. Uh, and at my lowest, there was a point, forget if it was like 2014 or 2015, but at your lowest point, you know, when, when you're broke and, and you don't have a career and your family life is suffering and all of this other stuff, I, I think I had, you know, some very negative thoughts, like the most negative thoughts you can have, as you could uh, imagine. And there was a day when I, I think I was at the lowest point in my life. Like it was the lowest I'd ever felt. There was no hope. These guys were never going to be brought to justice. Getting money back was going to be, you know, far harder than I thought. And, and the world wasn't how I thought. I, I thought of, well, I can either, you know, end things, so to speak, or I can try something different because I had spent three years in, in absolute misery. So I decided, okay, for the next month, I might lose my house. I might lose all my belongings. I might lose, you know, even, even family elements and, and all of that sort of stuff, but I'm going to spend the next month being happy, whatever the hell it takes. I'm going to get past this. I'm going to live day to day and, Literally, within one month to that day, it was at some point in October, uh, actually, the, the anniversary came uh, a few days ago, um, I landed a job that essentially, uh, you know, changed a, a lot of things for me, almost as if by magic, 
within within one one month to that day, it started the transition of the most horrible thing in my life to a lesson that I could use the rest of my life. And at that point, I got my career back. I picked up a bunch of the pieces and I was never willing to go back to that negative uh, a place in my life again. And and from there, you know, life changed. Not everything has been a success. Uh, it's not like you don't still have failures regardless of where you are in your life. Um, but I, I can say I got my career back at that point and um, started the transition to much more, you know, positive things literally within a month of considering making that change to, to happiness, willing happiness. That, what did that month look like? Like, what what was that to you? Because, I mean, it, it's bizarre. Like, happiness is is kind of it can be kind of this intangible thing, and it can be different from person to person. But I'm just I'm interested in what that looked like for you. What did you spend that month doing? How did you nourish that? It was initially not an easy thing to do because you go through literally three years of depression three years of sadness three years of battle um three years of not seeing any any hope of any kind you know obviously some of that is mental and some of that i think was literal to the situation but when you're potentially going to lose everything and you make that choice you start looking at the small things you start looking at okay i have my health uh, okay it's sunny out today and i can go for a walk okay, uh, um, you know, in my case, I have kids. So like kids can make a big difference to things too. Um, okay, I'm still creative. I still have my mental capacity. I'm still young, uh, you know, not that young, but young enough. Um, this whole thing that existed doesn't have to define me in any way. And rather than feeling sorry for myself, I'm now going to just start being creative again. Just start coming up with ideas again. Start reaching out to people who might make a difference in my life. It's, it's a very concerted effort to choose to be happy. It's not an easy thing and it requires, it does require like a d degree of mental toughness and, and thinking of the positive things. It's really, you know, I think trying to be in the moment and not focusing on what's gonna happen in the future or the past, but realizing right this second, you know, like even where we are right now, we're, we're all in three different places. And regardless of the bad shit that might be going on in your life, we're okay. We're not outside, we're not starving. We have food, we have, you know, good relationships in our life in whatever way. And it's just the focus you put on things. And, and the fact that not one issue like that has to define, you know, my whole future. You know, when, when, uh, when you met me, I was kind of like peeking out in a certain way in my life, like certain things in my life were going exceptionally well. Right. And then, um, you and I kind of bonded during that time. And then like not too long after that, I went through the fucking lowest moments of my life. And I remember you telling me, and I didn't, I wasn't sharing with everybody what was going on. I was, you know, like most, a lot of men do is silently struggling, mm -hmm. you know, on my own. But I remember you saying to me, you know, never forget that you're infinitely creative and no one can ever take that from you. And ideas will always be coming out of you no matter what. And that was one of those things that re actually reminds me of you sharing your story. It's like, I think that's what people need to remember. It's like when you're in those low moments, like that stuff that can come out of you, that creativity can give you a rebirth of your life. It's like, and you don't know where that's going to go or what that's going to be. But I think that's kind of like the human spirit in there, you know, and, and you being able to go and just decide, like, it's sunny today, I got my health, like that requires a certain kind of like, I'm going to creatively look at my life differently. I've been doing this for three years. And three years down this road leads to absolute horrible ending. And I just decided I don't want to go down that ending. I did the same thing. And I'm going to go this way. And it's really cool, like, you know, that you just decided that. And it's like, life turns. Sometimes it can be so, like, incredibly quick. But, like, it's amazing that you, like, tapped into your, like, creative, like, and really simple things, too. Because I think sometimes we think we need this big thing to come save us. But, like, what I'm hearing when you're sharing yours is uh, I'm hearing, like, there was an acceptance. Like, 
okay, this is hopeless. This isn't going to work. And I'm going to let that go. And instead of continuing going down this road or meeting the demise of this path, I'm going to just try for a month to go this way. And, and it's amazing, like three years and one month changed the trajectory of your life. Like it's fucking awesome, you know? Yeah, it, it, it really did. And, and there's so many lessons in it. It's, it's sometimes if you look back, like it was a, it was a horrible situation. Um, and, and that would be an undeniable thing in, in, in any way. But there's certain lessons that you learn personally, you know, from from something like that, that that carry you forever. I mean, you know, for instance, now I, I feel like the people who did this are full on sociopaths and I feel I can spot sociopaths more now. So if friends come to me, I, I can often help them with, you know, should you do business with this person or should you not do business with this person or, you know, certain intangible things like that. And the one thing I think I really learned creatively from the whole thing is there's this idea, I think with a lot of artists that great art comes from darkness and comes from a point of, of anger, hatred, sadness or whatever. And, and I understand that, but I actually feel like great art, even if you're in that state actually comes from a position of happiness because every artist I know, regardless of whether they're painters or filmmakers or uh, musicians or anything like that, when they're physically doing their art, they're legitimately at their happiest. Even if they're creating something dark, even if it's a dark subject, the fact that they're creating still comes from that position of happiness. And I, I think that's where great art, you know, ultimately comes from. And if, if you can, get out of that state of negativity and go create, you know, which I think exists a lot right now. I mean, there's so much um, uncertainty in the world and fear and, and all of that. And if you can just get past that and go create it, man, it, that's, that saved me even now. Like doing that has, has kept me happy on days when you look at the world and you just shake your head, what the hell is happening out there, but you're creating, I mean, how amazing is that? Yeah, we can get so sucked into everything. Like, like the three of us, we're we're all located in Canada, and you know, which is something that I feel very fortunate for. But I mean, I was just thinking about this yesterday, where I thought I'm like, oh, you know what? This this U.S. election seems quieter than than usual. Normally, it's just this crazy show, and I'm being inundated with all this information. And then I realized. No, you idiots, because you're not paying attention to it. <laughs> like you've shut it all. You've you've shut it down because like because that stuff. Because I I hear people like, not that these things aren't important to a certain extent, but people can get so occupied with that stuff, their whole lives can become all of this stuff that's happening out there. And you completely lose that creative capacity that's within yourself that has kind of a, a need to to come out and do something. And I think when you're when you get too focused on everything that's going on out there, like it it has a very it can have a very dark spiral that comes with it. I think I think very much. I think it's very easy, especially with social media right now, uh, and especially with the algorithms on how social media works, to get fed you know, a one side of the story and be extremely, extraordinarily negative information that makes you believe that the world is only a certain way. And in reality, the world is a kind of how you perceive it, you know, because we all have a bit of a different perception. So you can choose uh, to shut that off or to view any data set as positive or negative. And, and beyond that, no matter what scenario you're in, typically, you can just shut that off and go create. And I think, you know, the world does have a lot of negativity and creating something, whatever that is, a song, a script, uh, a painting or, or whatever, whether you're good or not, uh, whether you have extreme talent or not, you're bringing something positive into the world. You're bringing something that didn't exist into the world versus consuming information that can be just inherently negative and just becoming this this ball of negativity. And it, it's so easy to go down that path. We all spend, you know, probably too much time on the computers and on social media that, that feeds us negativity versus actually creating something that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was actually a time I remember uh, Evan and I were talking and I was just like, you know, man, I'm feeling, 
I don't know what's going on. I'm feeling kind of down. And he was just like, well, why don't you try turning off social media for a little bit? Just see what happens. I put my phone down for three months. I literally just put it wow. down. There. And I, this is my thing, Gabe. I would only check it in the morning and at the end of the day. And otherwise, I wouldn't even look at the thing. I left it in another really? room, wouldn't look at it. And three months, I cannot tell you how much happier I was. Like incredibly more happy. And I was like, wow, like this stuff is toxic. And what I did was I'm like, okay, when I started to pick my phone back up, I'm like, we're changing your, we're changing our entire relationship to social media and everything. And it's like my, my number one rule is now from now on, it's going to be on my terms. And I turned off all notifications. Like, like none of this shit notifies me anymore. I turned off all that stuff. The only way that someone can actually message me anymore is if they are a close friend and it like, and I, I never get updates about anything. And I like changed what I'll even engage with on my feed. And I won't even look at for like for uh, mostly I won't even look at the feed because I'm just like, forget it. I don't even want to look at the feed. And I just changed everything and it dramatically helped my life. I think people, if you're feeling down, I think honestly, it, I mean, not everybody feels like they can do this, but it was like a bold move. I was just like, put the phone down. Don't look at it. Cause it was like, and, and it, it guaranteed total clarity, totally polarized. The way I was using social media was causing my disharmony, was causing my upset feelings. It was directly related to that at least. And yeah, I just, I was like, it's my internal world that I don't want it to be that way. I don't want to be poisoned by this. I think that's really powerful. And I think, you know, with the with the algorithms that exist in social media, where you're literally fed the same thing over and over again, you know, like if I look at my social media now, there's probably, you know, 10 stories, 10 news things, uh, 10 people saying the same thing, you know, over and over. A, it, it, it feeds a level of closed mindedness, but I also think it feeds extreme negativity. It seems like you know, the media, the more negative a story, the more people kind of congregate to it. And in reality, in most places, we have pretty great lives, like not everywhere. And, and there's, that's not to say there aren't things to fight for that, you know, you believe in, in whatever capacity you believe in stuff. Um, but if you live in North America or Europe, you know, at, at least for the last bunch of years, you have a level of freedom that probably never existed, you know, for for our grandparents or even arguably our parents in terms of mobility, in terms of what you can do, in terms of what you can create and who you can reach out to. Um, and I think, you know, it's easy to forget that. And it's easy to just buy into this negativity that exists that really doesn't doesn't feed your soul. It's a, It's a very, it becomes a wall from you doing something that's really good with your life. And an excuse not to do something really good with your life because the world's going to hell. You know, if you if you watch enough of this stuff, you you, you get that idea. And it's not. You know, I, I don't feel that the, the world is going to hell. Well, then you should have a conversation with my dad. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, you know, in fairness to your dad, it's, it's a, especially right now, we're in uncertain times that you know we've never lived through that even our parents haven't lived through like it's not like it's not like our parents lived through you know what's considered a giant pandemic in any way and that our mobility has been restricted and and we've quarantined in our houses and um you know there there is a level of arguably economic desperation in certain cases that is a great concerning thing. But I think, you know, if you keep your head and you don't panic when other people are panicked and you think of ways that, you know, you can still do well, regardless of the situation you're in, um, you can actually come out of a scenario like this and, 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 and be better off. Yeah. You know, uh, we, we met up like, I think it was a month or two ago and um, we were having some really great conversations and I was sharing that actually a little bit with, with Evan, but we are talking about COVID and we are talking about the film industry. And, and one of the points that you raised, which I thought was really, was really cool, was you were saying, you know, I, I, I'm summarizing what you said, but sure. it was along the lines of how the film industry is like a necessary service. It's like an essential service. And because it's like mental health is such a big deal now, like all of a sudden, like, 
mental health was already becoming a big deal and then COVID hit and then like mental health everywhere. And if people aren't aware of this, like they're literally beginning to train people in like regular blue collar positions to learn how to deal with mental health because it's become such a big mm -hmm. thing. And you raise some interesting points about how like, you know, art is actually a, often the cure to a lot of mental health. It's like, like you didn't say it like that necessarily, but you, you created some great parallels and relationships to why we need to create, why this is so important and why we not need to not let fear dominate us away and scare us away from being creative people and actually trying to make stuff and share stuff. I don't know if you have a better way of articulating it, but I want to kind of, I guess, ask you like, what, what are your thoughts? Like we've had this pandemic, you've obviously gone out and literally made big movies and done stuff and got stuff together. What drove you? What were your thoughts on that? What's your point of view on this whole thing? Sure. Well, that, that's a great question. So if you look at the very beginning stages of, let's say, the pandemic, my whole thought was, no, they're not going to shut us down. There's no way. That's never happened. That's not going to happen in my lifetime. No, no chance. Um, and of course, I'm wrong, you know, as I often am. And, and of course, we get shut down. And within, if you're let's say a libertarian, or let's say you're somebody who values the ability to travel, the ability to, uh, you know, have certain freedoms that you have, getting hit with that, you know, uh, for whatever reason, it still hits you hard. It's like, it's like, okay, life is very different now. And as a filmmaker, you know, or, or any sort of artist to, to any sort of degree, you still have that need to create, you still have that desire to create. And as, as you know, I'm sitting through the pandemic with other people in my company, it's kind of like, well, we've, we've really got two choices here. You know, we can we can sit this out, it might last a year, might last half a year, might last three months, who knows, or screw it. We can do what we do best, which is go create. And me and Yaz, who I work, you know, very closely with within the company, we're like, well, you know, maybe this is an opportunity. Maybe this is a chance to develop things that, that we never really had the time to develop. And, and we can sit and talk daily and come up with an idea that, you know, is a really good idea. And, and Yaz and I workshopped an idea that could conceivably be filmed in a COVID-like world. And then we brought our friend uh, Mark Bachian, who's a, who's a brilliant showrunner and a, a brilliant writer, uh, to help us take the form of it. Um, and, and then just, you know, started to create, just started to like create the script and create the idea and, and all of that stuff. And, and to a large degree, you know, that and kind of keeping healthy during the quarantine is what kept me sane. You know, that was a big part of my sanity is that, okay, despite these uncertain and exceptional circumstances, I can bring a level of normalcy to my life. And now I actually have something to look forward to. Now we've actually created something. There's this, there's this very tight box that you can create in. Like you don't have necessarily unlimited creativity in this world now. You have limited mobility to some extent. You have certain restrictions. But okay, we'll, we'll play within those confines and we're still going to come up with something great. And we came up with the concept to a film called Valera, um, which we've, we've started filming uh, around the world in, I think it's going to be in like seven different countries um covid safe and all of that sort of stuff and um just decided not to let the limitations put on us limit us because they don't they don't have to there's almost there's almost no circumstance short of you being in jail uh and even then people are writing books in jail there's almost no circumstance short of sort of something like that that can stop you um you look at like somebody like you know let's say tarkovsky in 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 soviet russia uh, where there's hardcore, hardcore rules in the 70s, creating magnificent sci-fi without, without the ability, you know, there was no visual effects in, and he didn't have costumes, and he just had to use his mind and his creativity, and, and he comes away with these timeless films. There's almost no circumstance, if you're willing not to panic, and you're willing to be bold, and you're willing to take a chance, that you can't do something great under any circumstance. Well, I mean, sometimes, I mean, I very often find that my best creativity comes out of limitations. 
you know, because like sometimes when you've just got an embarrassment of riches, like you can get sort of option paralysis when you can just sort of do anything, you know, like you have unlimited sort of resources, resources, so to speak. You know, sometimes it's just like you strip things down and suddenly you, you because you have to find a way like you're like forced into this incredible creative state and something really, truly brilliant comes out of it. I very much agree. I think, you know, sometimes putting a box on on creativity forces you to actually be extra creative. Um, and sometimes when you don't have that box, it becomes very hard to create because you have just all of these ideas, you know, spinning around. And uh, I think in, in our case, you know, do I like the quarantines? I don't know that anybody can say that they like them, whether you agree with them or not. You don't necessarily like being trapped in your house or trapped in any scenario. Um, but, you know, the way the world has sort of worked out, it forced us to get very creative. And I think I look at the footage that we're creating and the people we're creating it with, and it's incredible to me that, that um, you can come away with something so beautiful in such a what seems like a negative circumstance. Mm. Well, yeah, it's, you know, it's, I think that's the thing is regardless of what's going on in the world, the pandemic or not, it's like, there's, there's always going to be excuses, you know, like when you met me, like I was just beginning that school the filmmaking school and my tagline was make films, not excuses. Right. <laughs> but it's like, people were making excuses then, you know, it's like people are always going to make excuses always and i think that you know i think evan and i have have you know we've always tried to kind of spread the word of like how about what if you didn't make the excuse like what's what's the other option i think what's really cool is having you on is you're literally somebody who's here not making an excuse and running a company and really like legitimately like making your career in the film industry and just going okay like this is the world now they're trying to shut down the entire film industry and it's opening up back up you know, well, Vancouver is kind of nice that way because we mm -hmm. have it open more, but it's like, um, and you're one of the people that's saying, you know, you're in your own little way, pushing the forefront of like, we're going to make a space for this, you know? And I think like, that's what artists need to do because there's always going to be times where there's, there's always going to be an option for an excuse, always. There's absolutely no doubt about it. And you know, I, I always, for a long time, I guess I considered art as almost like a bit of a superficial thing, like a distraction or, or something like that. And, and art isn't a distraction. It is what you live for, what a lot of us live for. It's for the soul. It's like, it's, it's what gives beauty to the world. It's what, um, it's, it's not just a distraction. It's, it's a lesson and it's, you know, if I think of all the places I've been in the world, and I've been very fortunate to be in, in many places, it's often the art. Uh, like you go to like a place that, like Berlin, and they have this, this amazing, you know, wall art, like almost like a certain graffiti. And when I think back to Berlin, I immediately think of that, or the film festivals I've gone to, or uh, some of the musical events I've gone to. That's what I live for. And I think a lot of people live for that, too. And they don't realize how important art actually is, like that art is in a certain sense everything it's it's that thing that makes life in many ways worth living with you know other things as well um and i think it's so essential for anybody who's an artist you know and uh, there's a lot of artists right now suffering to uh stop and create to stop and you know understand whatever shell you're in come out of the shell and do something even if it's in your house even even if it's you know quarantine art whatever it is you have a voice everybody has a voice and it's good to hear that voice get your voice out there in whatever capacity you you, you can with the art that you can create hmm. well i think that i mean i've always found that art and whatever medium it is you know like it's one of those things you can go on a big rabbit hole of what is art you know and and there's like a whole philosophy there's like a whole division of philosophy that's basically devoted to that whole question but i mean for me in my experience like art is really about pointing to something other for me it's about pointing to something transcendent you know to the, a certain capacity whatever you want to call it you know it's it's something that can speak to the huge mysteries that 
we are just completely saturated by in our lives. You know, like it's it's something that that can express that in some sort of tangible way. And 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 it, I think that that's absolutely a part of our survival, but we don't necessarily look at it that way, like because, you know, we we're a very sort of we're a very material based society, particularly in the in the Western world, you know, so it's just like there's just the mechanics of things. And, and of course, there are mechanics of things and we have biology and physics and, and but there's this whole there's this whole other realm, you know, that like I'm, I'm going to say something. Maybe people think this is crazy, but like, you know, there's a whole realm of being that that I think religion was supposed to talk to religion stopped talking to that so now we have art <laughs> mm -hmm. i could i could definitely see that i mean I, i've heard so many great ways that art is put throughout the years and i, I feel like you know i feel like we're sort of like energy like we are a, a form of energy and art is what deeply gets inside of our souls like it's the thing that that transcends whatever energy we are and and, and fills us up i i, I you know, I've seen so many moving movies, paintings, music that in whatever way changed my life and imagining all that stuff go away. It would just be like you'd be living this horrible existence that almost doesn't feel like it would have meaning or you wouldn't be able to connect with other people over the same meaning. You know, like there's there's something that I, I feel like brings us together with different forms of art that that it doesn't any other way. And, 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 you know, especially I feel very fortunate to be in film because, you know, I'm obviously biased being in film, but I feel like stories and powerful stories with deep messages bring us together in a way unlike any other art almost in history. Not that music doesn't in another way or, or whatever the case is, but I, I do feel like film and documentaries can change the world. And, and I, I feel like they have been. Mm. There's, um, there's actually this thing I teach in, in the courses that I do, and it's, I call it, um, well, actually I learned it from, uh, actually I learned it from Ted McGrath, who was a business coach of mine, but he talks a lot about story and he talks a lot about present storytelling. And, um, I kind of being that I've been in the film industry telling, writing scripts and stuff, I kind of took that a little bit further, but his concept initially was present storytelling. And he, he talks about how, when you tell a story, people literally get transfixed and transformed into your story. And for example, I'll, I'll do an example just so you understand. It, it, so I'm nine years old and I'm, I'm on the field and, and I've never scored a goal before. Right. And all the, all the parents, they're looking at us and my, my friend's dad, he's got the camera on us, right. He's filming the game and all of a sudden the ball gets passed over to me. And I, I, I hit the ball and it goes into the net and then all my friends, you know, everybody on the team is just cheering that the, the parents are cheering and it's the first goal I ever scored. And I look over at all the parents and everyone's, everyone's there except for mine. Oh. And in that moment I realize you're right. So, but when I'm telling you the story, right. So I'm just telling you a realization I had as a kid, right? And and then the story goes on and you, and you kind of want to know like, well, what, what, yeah. where does this go? What happens? But while I'm telling you a story, if I tell it as though it's happening and I tell it so it's real, you literally, your mind jumps to the field. Yeah. You see the parents, you're on the field. You're, you even see the camera that the parent is holding. All of that is just boom in your mind. And that's the power of story. And like, that's why it's so important that we create and we tell our story, whether it's through painting or music or whatever, because you know, you listen to those songs and you get transfixed into that song. You get that, that music tells a story that even not even the lyrics, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's, um, I think it's one of those things that people don't always realize how important this stuff is and not, you don't even have to be great at it. A lot of the time it's just you trying to do it, which is so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. I think the actual act of creating um, can be more important than what you create. And I feel like if you create enough, you actually get to be incredibly good at whatever the area you're creating in. I mean, none of us start as 
typically none of us start as amazing at what they what they do it's something you build up to it's it's your 10th project or your 20th project that's the one that that you know shows oh wait a minute this this person has some real talent and you've got to do it you know for long enough but i think the act of creating itself is highly cathartic and especially in in a day you know in days like today um uh, where you know there is uncertainty in the world and there's certain things that that none of us know exactly how things are going to work out but bringing something into the world as opposed to just experiencing negativity that exists in the world is so much more positive and so much better i think uh, for a person health wise and even for their soul if you don't mind i'd love to go back to one thing you, sure. you were, when you were younger and you met your mentor yeah. and you were saying you're failing like, you know, a lot, <laughs> but this person still saw something in you. Um, what do you think that this, um, I don't, I forget his name at the moment, but what do you yeah. think that he saw in you? Like, why, why do you think he kind of gave you and looked past maybe where you might've been fumbling around? Cause I'm, I'm going to kind of make a stab that you, had a quality about the way you were trying to go about life, an energy or a, an attitude or uh, something. And I feel like sometimes, like I, I felt like with you, with you even like, and, and me and a, a lot of the ways you helped me, you, you helped me see a quality that I was bringing to the world. And in my darkest moments, I could hang on to that quality. And it's so nice when someone sees that in you. And I just felt like I was messing up everywhere. But that little bit of light, kept me going and it also helped me to rebuild a lot of the stuff that I might have actually not been building the way that I really wanted to build. So my question for you is like during that time you're young, you're fumbling around, but someone saw something, what do you think was happening for you? Well, you know, initially when I when I started in my practicum, I started as a as a production assistant, and I had to be the world's worst production assistant. Um, I was forgetful. They told me to write things down. I didn't write things down. I, I didn't fully grasp the concept of set. I didn't grasp how many things could be going at at one point. There's certain people who get out of film school and they just get it. They just have that, you know, spatial ability to see all the things going on and and they just understand I was not that guy. So, uh, you know, getting coffees I was terrible at. I was terrible at, at uh, remembering to bring certain things to the shoot. There was a couple of shoots delayed because I was such an idiot, you know, over what I was supposed to bring. <laughs> and I feel like, you know, the one thing, if I had to guess, it of course being a guess, is I just never gave up. You know, no matter if I got yelled at, if I got, uh, you know, reamed out, and, and maybe rightfully so in certain cases, because I screwed up pretty bad. I just never gave up. I had that thing in me that's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to get it right. I'm going to take my lessons. I deserve my lessons and I'm going to keep going. And I think, you know, the one area that I can excel in, um, I don't know that I'm smarter than most people. I, I don't know that I'm more creative than most people, but if I decide I'm going to outwork most people, there's not that many people. If I get in my zone and I'm going to outwork them and, and, I was the first person on set sometimes and I was the last person to leave and whatever it took to learn the lessons I need to learn. And I think it was that because there definitely was no inherent talent with me. But I think, you know, as, as he taught me more and, and, you know, he was incredibly generous with his time. I do think I kind of learned fast, like over a bit of time. Once I get something, I really get it. And then, you know, you add that to work ethic and I think you can accomplish almost anything. And I think, you know, I could be wrong, you know, maybe, uh, maybe he just felt sorry for me because I was so <laughs> pathetic or something like who knows. Right. Um, but for whatever reason, you know, if I had to guess, I think, I think it's that. And even, you know, myself, if I look at somebody who's a bit of a screw up, but they're willing to, they're willing to work hard, I'll give them another chance, you know, and, and uh, I love mentoring people and getting them to a, to a great position. And I've been lucky that, you know, people I have mentored weren't as big of a screw up as I was. So it's, it's been easier on me than it was on Jerry. Hmm. <laughs> we have, um, we have a series of questions we like to ask. Um, and we'll, we're going to get to that in a second, but, um, Evan and I always have a beer. It's a tradition on the okay. podcast. Please. And, uh, we like to just kind of make a comment cause we, we started these conversations through having a craft beer and literally having conversations like these. 
And, Absolutely. You know, look at this. But, 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 uh, that's, that's as good a reason as any to crack open a beer. So please, gentlemen, yeah. I, I, I'm not a beer guy, but I, I appreciate uh, <laughs> I appreciate you guys are. Yeah. What do you got, Evan? Uh, you know what? I'm just I've been drinking one that I've had a few times now because I I didn't run out to get uh, to get more, but I'm enjoying it all the way, which is the um, uh, from Phillips Brewings, the Citricity uh, IPA, the grapefruit IPA. Nice. Good stuff. I am. Um, I got a different one today. This is from Whistler Brewing Co. and it's called the Black Cherry Marzen. Um, oh. It's uh, it's really like black cherry. It's very flavorful and it's tasty it's like um uh, to me this is like one of those special beers it's not the one that i am gonna go and drink a whole bunch of but it's like one of those one you have one maybe and you're like wow it was really nice and then you kind of move on but it was a very memorable kind of beer so it's one of those and i kind of knew it would be like that so there you go very nice i'm a, I'm a baileys and milk guy oh nice <laughs> <laughs> They have like a name for that. It's like a brown cow or something like that. Right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, okay, Evan, how about you start with the question set? All right. Uh, first question. I'm having a little trouble hearing Evan. Oh, you went really quiet. Oh, sorry. Hello? There we go. You got me? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, all right. First question. What is the most important book you've ever read? Oh man. Okay. I, I think, I think I have this. I think I've read some very, very important books in my life. And I think a lot of the books that I've read, especially even from a young age were very motivational books. So, um, but I think back to my high school and, um, the one book that, that came to mind right away was man's search for meaning by Viktor Frankl. And Man's Search for Meaning, uh, for those that don't know, and I think everybody on earth should read that book, like right now, read that book. Uh, it's, it's about a guy who was in, a, a young man who was in a concentration camp uh, in, you know, during the time of World War II that had to find a way to survive. And despite I, I don't think there's, you know, are, are there worse conditions than a concentration camp in World War II? I, I, I don't know. I, I can't think of any. Found a way to still, I hesitate to find, say, happiness, but found a way to still, uh, you know, exist in that circumstance and not, you know, not want to kill himself, not be so miserable, and, and sort of give the lesson that no matter what circumstance you're in, you can find you can find a way to be positive um, and, and to some extent to be happy. It's, it's one of the most profound books I think you could ever read. I think it's like a, a very important book, especially for now um, with everything that's happening in the world and, and to realize, you know, you're, you're the author of your own book. You're the captain of your own ship and you can choose what you feel at any given moment, typically. Hmm. Yeah. That's an, that, that's such an incredible book. Like it, <laughs> when you said that, I was just like, oh my, because what I remember reading that for the first time and just, I don't know how many times I just had to, like, I would read like a paragraph or a sentence and I just had to put the book down for a second just to like, I like just absorb yeah what I, what, what just came into my brain. Yeah. It's incredible. Brilliant. I mean, it's, it's, it should be required reading for every kid. And I hope it is around the world to a make sure something like that, you know, obviously never happens again. I think, I think the teaching of that, but also to understand if this, if this one person was able to get through that, find meaning in it, find, find happiness in the darkest of circumstances. Like, I, I don't know that any of us really have, you know, we, we all have our, our burdens and our issues. I think if you choose to be happy, you're going to lead a better life and you're going to create better stuff. Hmm. Yeah, that was a that was an incredible book. Yeah. Okay, next question. What film has made the greatest impact on you? Uh, there's, there's I, I have to list I have to list three. I have to. I'm going to break okay. the rules and I'm going to list <laughs> three. But I'm going to list them in the order that I would say they probably made a difference for me. Uh, the first one is the Shawshank Redemption. And I think, you know, very much that almost goes back to man's search for meaning uh, with Viktor Frankl, the book. It's, it's, 
in the worst of conditions, this person found a way to survive. I think, I think again, that, that, that story just somehow appeals to me in my life. I, I don't think I had the easiest upbringing as, as, a, as a child. And I think um, just where that story goes, how brilliantly it's written, how, how incredible it is, I, I think it's the best movie. To me, it's the best movie ever done. I, I would say the second one was probably Blade Runner. And what that did is that just opened my mind to science fiction. It just opened my mind to, you know, uh, there's a whole series of deep themes there, but but the idea of creating something like that, uh, and I think that's why I got into, you know, science fiction as well. Like that film just inspired me. The original Blade Runner, not the new one. Uh, new one's okay, but I think the original is the original. And then I think the third one, which is much more modern, is Whiplash. Hmm. Whiplash completely turned me on my head as to the idea of good you know just you did a good job what is that i don't want to ruin it for anyone but go watch go watch whiplash i mean if you watch all three of those films i think they're all incredible films that gets i mean that, that i've got it I'll, I'll get not that it matters but that gets my seal of, of approval <laughs> yeah, they're, they're all mind-blowing great film i don't think you're going to go wrong with any of them yeah <laughs> actually uh, you know what i just want to tell a quick story i was 14 when i saw shawshank redemption 13 maybe actually and it was funny because i was staying at my friend's place and we were his mom was like you know we we're like what movie do you watch and his mom had shawshank and um, we're like, ah, well, I guess we'll watch this movie. And we're like 13 bratty little kids, like, think we're too cool. And we sit down and watch this film. And I remember him and I afterwards were like, holy shit. <laughs> just oh. like afterwards, we're just like, what a great film. Because we like did not, like, you know, like when you're a little, you don't expect it. And it just, we knew nothing about it. And it was just, I just remember it so vividly because we came into it with this kind of like, we're too cool for school kind of attitude. And literally just were transfixed at the end of a movie and just kind of like, and it's kind of funny how that can happen, you know, with a movie, it can just kind of alter your life a little bit. And it's so memorable to me. I remember where I was. I remember the time of day. I remember so many details because of that film. It's, it's, it's one of those films where, you know, uh, on my darkest day, where I feel like humanity has no hope, the fact that somebody could create something with such a, a beautiful message that's so uh, powerful in so many ways gives me hope. Hmm. You know, and, and I hope someday in my career I can do, you know, I, I think I've been fortunate enough to be part of what I would consider some great films. But man, oh man, like just to be part of anything even close to that, I hope I hope I get to touch that level of greatness someday. Hmm. Man, this uh, already it's like uh, okay, this that's a book I have to reread and a couple of movies I have to rewatch. There you uh, go. <laughs> <laughs> all right, next question is: What is a song or album that takes you somewhere else? Oh man. There's so many, so many artists. It, it's funny because like I, I grew up, uh, you know, I was born in, I'll date myself, but whatever. I was born in 73, but you kind of like always congregate, it seems to the music that existed when you were in high school or, you know, those sort of junior high and high school years. So I'm like, I'm like so much of a, of an eighties kid as it relates to music and almost everything I, I listen to, except for, you know, a few exceptions is like 80s stuff. It would be so hard to just name one one album, but you know the police synchronicity I always thought was great. Uh, Tears for Fears stuff I always thought was great. Um, if you're talking about a little more modern, when I really want to get creative, there's there's these two artists. I think they're out of out of uh, Russia, and they create this almost like super. Uh, I don't know, like trippy kind of trip hop music that that incorporates sounds. They're called Monocle and Galoon. And when I really need to be creative, sometimes I'll, I'll listen to that. And it's, I don't know, it's just so ethereal and interesting that, that I love that. But I mean, you could probably almost name any 80s artist that was popular then. And I'd be like, oh my God, I love them. Or, you know, w w with a couple of exceptions, I'd probably love anybody from then. Mm. It's very like, it's like music is very timely uh, in your life, like 
an experience for you? Yeah, it, it very much is. And, you know, I'm definitely trapped in the 80s to a large degree. <laughs> so for whatever reason, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck there musically. But I listen to some more modern stuff, too. And there's some really amazing artists out now. And I feel like also I'm, I'm the old guy that feels like, oh, music's gone to shit, you know, to some extent, too. And I think I think I, I mean, I'm biased, but I think it has in some ways. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm, I'm a curmudgeon now in that way, too. <laughs> As long as you know it. I know it. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's, that's part of the reason that I'm probably very uncool to my kids too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Here's my next one for you. Um, where do you think creativity comes from? Oh, that's very deep. Uh, and I, I do actually think it comes from a deep spot. And I think regardless of whether you're, um, whether you're religious or not, because I don't have a better word for it, I think true creativity, creativity that's going to move people, creativity that's going to cause emotion in other people comes from your soul. And I think when you're actually creating, if you legitimately feel the emotion that you're trying to create in others, it somehow almost magically transcends. So in other words, if I'm creating um, a comedy, you know, and I'm writing and I'm, I'm not laughing, I don't think other people are going to laugh that much too. And, and if I'm creating something, you know, greatly dramatic that has a depth to it or whatever, and, and, and I'm not feeling that when I'm creating, I think you're, you're still creating and there's still beauty to that, but it's more of a superficial exercise as opposed to the transcendence of emotion. Hmm. And I think if you want to be at the top of your game in any creative endeavor, you actually get paid based on that transcendence of emotion based on the genre you create. So, you know, somebody like Frank Darabont in, in Shawshank Redemption, uh, whatever his value is, which is millions and millions of dollars, uh, I think is worth it because he created that transcendent emotion in so many people, you know, worldwide. When, when the best list of films comes out almost anywhere, Shawshank is top three. Hmm. You know, and maybe sometimes it's Citizen Kane, sometimes it's Casablanca, but it's it's almost that. And I think as artists, you know, you get paid um, based on how much emotion you create in other people. I think that comes from the soul. I think, yeah, like uh, that. I agree with you. And I uh, like I have written um, I wrote a script at one point and Evan, I've talked about it a bit, but I wrote a script and it was like very like it went like through me. It was not like uh, very little. I felt very little control over the creative part of it. It was like what was pouring out of me was more of a, like a deeper thing. It was, it was much more, I felt much more of a conduit to the creativity. Yeah. Um, Oliver Stone, he shares on the Joe Rogan podcast that he made like, he had written like 12 scripts and had like no success with them. And it was always a struggle and he had written a book and he felt it was too like narcissistic. And he was like, ah, he's like, he didn't know he already went through a divorce. And then, um, he created platoon and platoon was from he was like upset with the way movies were being written about this thing he actually experienced and platoon is like one of the most iconic war films of all time incredible he, he said that it was the most interesting experience because it was the first time that the producers wanted the movie to get made and he felt his whole career was like, he was always fighting to get it made. And someone now all of a sudden was fighting to get it made more than him or in a way like, and, and I think that's a testament to what happens when you have something that you really want to say, like creatively, like whatever was coming through him with Platoon, like he had something to say. And like, you know, in a lot of ways that came into the movie. I think that's why it is what it is. So. Yeah. I think I think very much. I think if you really put, you know, your soul into things and your feeling and your emotion in, in whatever, that includes horror. You know, if you want people to be scared when you're writing it, you probably uh, need to feel scared. Like, I think those I, I can't imagine, you know, some, I, I don't really like horror because I don't like being scared. But, you know, some of the horror films I've seen. I have to think that the writer was like scared when he was writing this because, damn, I'm scared watching this. Uh, and I think. I think empathically we feel each other's emotion and that translates uh, that translates very much with art. And I think that's why art is so powerful is it's, it's a way we all connect through emotion to some extent, like the really powerful art. Next question, sir. Mm -hmm. Where or how do you find inspiration? 
where, how do I find inspiration? Um, oh man, I, I, I don't know that I even necessarily know my whole process. I, I feel like, you know, I, I feel like one of the things about me is I, I don't know that I'm particularly talented, but I feel like I have really good taste and I feel like I can understand when something can be really interesting for a relatively wide group of people. So I, I feel like sometimes, you know, it can come from uh, reading something. It can come from music. Sometimes it feels like it's just a spontaneous thing. Like uh, sometimes to calm myself down during a day, I'll go for a you know, car ride wherever I am. And just the act of driving sometimes leads to creativity or talking to, you know, my business partners. And we're kind of like, did you hear about this? Well, this would be really cool if we did this. Well, what about this? And, and it's also the idea of, you know, I feed off of brainstorming with other people and I'm pretty open-minded. So I never become too um, fixated on my own ideas if somebody has a better idea and, and they can justify why it's a better idea. Um, but I don't know. Like, I, I feel like, you know, as, as it relates to my own ideas, it definitely comes from an emotional spot because I get really excited by it in whatever capacity. And then it has to come out. I have to tell the people that I'm working with, we need to, you know, do something like this. And um, luckily, they're open minded, too. And then, you know, we just find a way to execute. Um, but, you know, the really good stuff I do feel like comes from my soul. I feel like it almost comes from an otherworldly spot, like an energetic spot that it just has to come out. Hmm. All right, Gabe, you ready All for right. this one? It's going to okay. get real. <laughs> okay. Oh man. What is the one thing you would tell your childhood self? Oh man. I, I think, I think the, the, the biggest thing would be, it's all going to be okay. Cause in the end, no matter what circumstance you're in, like, a, there's a reason we, we all exist right now. We've all been through some, some crazy shit in our life, and we always found a way. No matter how bad the situation is, it's going to be okay. You know. And there's almost no circumstance in life where it's not going to be okay. There's very few of those circumstances that exist that – you know, I've been, I've been, like I said, I think I've been to the darkest place that a human can be at without actually, let's say, pulling the trigger or doing something really, really negative. And, and in the end, I would tell, you know, my kid self, it, it's just going to be okay. Cause so much of the shit I, I, you know, sorry for swearing so much of the stuff I've been through in my life that I stressed out about ended up, you know, literally being a little tiny speck in my life. And, and as long as you're willing to, to persevere through regardless, whatever circumstances, it's all just peaks and valleys and blips and dots and, you know, things that just happen. There's, there's no circumstance, probably no circumstance you can't overcome. Hmm. And the final question. <laughs> all right. What would your future self tell you now? Oh man, what would my future self tell me now? Um, I think my future self would tell me create. Under all circumstances, go create because creation is, is, is what brings something positive in the world. Creation is your voice. Creation is what allows you to connect with other people. Creation is the most fun you have. So rather than focusing, you know, because I, I think by nature, I'm a little bit of a dark person. I do have a tendency often to focus on the negative and that can go down a very deep rabbit hole that isn't good for me. And I don't think it's good for most people, but when I'm creating, I'm not in that rabbit hole. I'm in my happy place and I'm, I'm doing it with, with people who are brilliant, who are probably smarter than me and, and, and have more talent in many ways than me. And, and it just lifts everything up. Like it's just, it's the most excitement I can have. And I think, you know, that's probably, probably say that. And he'd probably say, you know, don't stress about stupid things and don't be an idiot and a bunch of other things like that. But um, create is, I think, you know, the biggest thing. It's kind of like we paid you off to say all this stuff. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is the funny thing is like, Evan and I, we just, we have these conversations and then we're like talking about it and like literally we just stepped into this conversation. There was really not much of our pre-talk. And the fact that you said what you said, it just kind of reconfirms that this whole thing that we're trying to 
share with others. And even like each week, I'm so lucky. I get to talk with my best friend about art and we just get to talk it out and we always leave a little better off, but we mm -hmm. always kind of hit on a lot of these same messages. And I love hearing your answers to those questions, Gabe, because I feel like the same thing you, you would tell your, you know, your future self would tell you is like, great. And it, like, when you said that, I'm like, yeah, like, man, what a good thing to hear. Like, it's just like, there's so much bullshit that I'll make up in my life and I don't. And then I'm like, yeah, man, when you create, you're, you're like, just try and let that out, find an avenue, find a way, like, like do something with it. And you know, there's, it's so easy to get caught up on stuff that just isn't important, you know, like anyway. There's always a way, you know, I think, I think regardless of your circumstance, regardless of where you are, there's always a way to create. There's really never a significant enough excuse that you can't in whatever capacity, even if it's something small, go create. Amazing. Thank you so much, Gabe. And thank you for creating this conversation with us. <laughs> ah, well, thank you guys for having me. It's always an honor and a pleasure. And uh, I, I appreciate you guys having me on. Thanks for listening to the show. If you got something out of this, if you feel it improved your life or your journey in any way, please take a moment to subscribe, leave a review, or share the episode. You can also support us on Patreon, where we have tons of great bonuses. You are the ones that make the show possible and help us to thrive. Thank you for joining us.